Disclaimer. This story contains descriptions of Nazi war crimes that some listeners may find upsetting. Incoming transmission. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to True Spies. Week by week, mission by mission, you'll hear the true stories behind the world's greatest espionage operations. You'll meet the people who navigate this secret world. What do they know? What are their skills? And what would you do in their position? This is True Spies. We kept lists of the missing. Diana, Vera, Yolande, Eliane, Madeleine, Andre, Nora. This is True Spies. Episode 41, Seven Female Spies. The Second World War didn't end in 1945. Well, not for everyone. Not for Vera Atkins. This week's true spy died 21 years ago at the age of 92. She's voiced here by an actor, and we've used research to tell her story as we think she might have told it. During the war, Vera Atkins worked for the Special Operations Executive, If you're a regular listener to this podcast, you'll be familiar with the Special Operations Executive. But here's a refresher. The SOE was a top-secret arm of British intelligence, headquartered in central London. It sent its agents, a mixture of British and European citizens, on perilous missions behind enemy lines. Tragically, many never returned. This is the story of one woman's tireless search for the agents who didn't come home. It was March, early March, in 45. The Russians, the French, the Americans, they were liberating camps. Not all of them, of course, but enough for information to begin trickling through. Thousands of POWs on the move, mostly traveling east. And I received a note from the French about uh, John Hopper. John Hopper was a spy who had been captured in occupied France. He was imprisoned and later transferred to Germany. When the French liberated the prison, they found an unusual note next to his name in the prison records. N and N. Naturally, I asked my sources to confirm the meaning. They came back with an answer. Nacht und Nebel. In English, that's night and fog. Hitler had issued the Nacht and Nebel order in 1942. It was a special prisoner classification intended for spies and resistance operatives. If a prisoner was assigned Nacht and Nebel status, it meant that they would disappear. Nobody would ever know what had become of them. Vera didn't know it yet, but those two letters, scrawled in the margins of a dog-eared record book, would become her constant companions. We sent over 400 to France. A quarter of them, at least a quarter, didn't return. They had vanished, as if into night and fog. Vera was going to find out how. But who was Vera Atkins? In a sense, it's hard to know. Tall, elegant, and always immaculately dressed, she was often described as cagey, closed off, unemotional. Outside of the government's official records, very little was known about her life before the war. It is something on which I have closed the book. I have closed the book on many things in life. The mystery shrouding her origins was entirely by design. But here's what we do know. Vera was born to a Jewish family in Romania. She came to live in England at some point during the 1930s after making contacts in British intelligence through her role as a secretary at the German embassy in Bucharest. She joined the SOE in 1941, having been recommended by a contact. If she was particularly excited by the appointment, she certainly didn't show it. I received an 
anodyne little letter out of the blue, telling me to come for an interview. I went to see a woman I did not much like. She wouldn't say exactly what it was that I would be doing. I said I would give it a month. If I liked it, I would stay. Regardless, she quickly became an influential voice within F section, the department of the special operations executive that worked in occupied France. The coolness and unsentimentality that made her so unknowable also made her a highly effective spy master. But in spite of her outward demeanor, she felt a deep sense of responsibility towards the agents she recruited. After all, there was a good chance that she would be sending them to their deaths. As the war drew to its bloody close, Vera was effectively running F section. Buck Morris Buckmaster had been the head of F section since its inception, really. By 1945, after V Day, he'd gone back to Ford managing public relations there. John Center, he was the organization security director, had gone back to the bar. The whole organization was winding down as if the work was finished. Vera sensed that the SOE's days were numbered. Throughout 1945, she had been lobbying her contacts in the British government for a commission, a military rank, at officer level. Up until this point, she had been denied this, because officially, due to her Romanian background, she was considered an enemy alien in the UK. Without a rank, and without the authority of the SOE behind her, she would lack the means to conduct any further investigations into what had happened to F Section's missing agents. Well, the vast majority of my colleagues would have been quite happy to assign them missing, presumed dead. Their files would be closed, as if, well, as, as if they had never existed. The female agents of the SOE were a particular point of interest for Vera. At first, there was a great deal of resistance to the idea of sending female agents to France. Unsuitable temperaments. The public would never stand for it, you know, the usual arguments. As it turned out, women were among the most effective of the SOE's operatives in Europe. Vera had recruited many of them personally. Yes, I put most of those girls on the plane. Like Vera, the SOE's female agents weren't given a military rank. For field agents, the reason for this came down to deniability there would be no official record that women had been used for such unladylike operations. Unfortunately, this also meant that if they were captured, they would not qualify for prisoner of war status. So whose responsibility were they? If they were confirmed dead, executed as spies, would their relatives be entitled to a government pension? Would those relatives even be told what had happened to their wives, daughters and mothers? And if they were found alive by the Americans or the Russians, who would be responsible for repatriation? It was a mess. It wouldn't have happened to men. By the spring of 1945, Vera began to fear that the fates of her missing agents would never be discovered. Allied forces were closing in on Berlin. The Nazis rushed to burn their records. The Russians left little but death and debris in their wake. It was chaos. And then, it got worse. We began to receive intelligence about the camps. As the war in Europe shuddered to a halt, the true horrors of the Nazi concentration camps revealed themselves. In April, the Americans liberated Buchenwald. General Patton blew the lid. The pictures were everywhere. We had lost 17 of our men there. This confirmed Vera's worst fears. If SOE agents had been captured, they had likely been executed. And then more camps were liberated. Belsen, Dachau, Ravensbrück. But she couldn't know for sure. And as long as that uncertainty was there, Vera would always crave the truth. Some agents did come home. Adette Sansom, who had escaped from the women-only Ravensbrück camp, shed the most light on what might have happened to some of Vera's missing agents. Before Ravensbrück, they had tortured Adette in Paris, then moved her to Karlsruhe prison near the French-German border. She said she had travelled there with seven other women, all SOE. I showed her pictures of the girls that had been, as yet, untraceable. 
she identified six of the seven from their photographs. Vera Lee, Diana Rowden, André Borel, Yolande Beekman, Madeleine Damemont, Alain Plumen. And the seventh? The woman that Adette could not confirm as having been on the transport to Karlsruhe prison was to Vera perhaps the most interesting of all. More on that later. She made it her sole mission to find out what had happened to the missing seven. But how? Weigh up your options. You've spent the last few years of your life as part of an organization that ran agents all over Europe. Could you use their contacts? Rely on whispers and hearsay, telegrams and crackling phone calls? Or would you take a more active approach? It was becoming less and less likely that our agents would just show up in the Russian zone. So there was a feeling that it was more urgent as a result to find out what had happened to them, definitively. I saw that we needed someone on the ground, over there, if we were ever going to get anything done for these girls. After months of lobbying, Vera was on the verge of being allowed to conduct her own investigation. She was helped by the fact that the public were beginning to become aware of the sheer scale of Nazi atrocities. People wanted answers, and they wanted justice, too. There was, if I can put it this way, a growing market for war crimes. So, eventually, they gave me my commission. Squadron officer, Women's Auxiliary Air Force. And I was allowed an exploratory trip to Germany to see what I could turn up. They gave me four days. In December 1945, Vera left London for the German spa town of Bad Oenhausen, where the British Army had established its headquarters. It was not a fruitful trip. She spoke to a number of captured Nazis, including two concentration camp commandants. But as an interrogator, Vera was still learning the ropes. And four days is no time at all. She came back to London none the wiser about the fates of her seven missing women. But the fire that fueled this personal mission had been well and truly stoked. Back at home, Vera began another charm offensive. This time, she was asking for a more permanent position in Germany. But a job, however unusual, generally requires an employer. I learned that the government planned to close down the Special Operations Executive at the end of the year. This was in December. Once the SOE was dissolved, no other government department would take on the outstanding workload. As far as the British government were concerned, nobody would be looking for the missing women. Until Jörka Galitzin. Jörka Galitzin was a young intelligence officer who had been tasked with gathering evidence of German war crimes. He was Vera's key to being taken seriously. Among the countless horrors that he encountered on his travels through Europe, one place in particular stood out. Yes, so Natzweiler was a small camp. It was up in the mountains on the French-German border, uh, on the French side, uh, just about. And Galitzin had discovered that for many of those Nacht- und Nebel prisoners, Natzweiler was the last stop. He had also, and this is what caught our true spy's attention, uncovered evidence that at least one British woman had been executed within its walls. Galitzin uh, delivered his report in the summer of 1944. It was buried. I don't know why. This infuriated Galitzin. Eventually, his report was leaked to the media, sparking an official investigation into the deaths at the Natzweiler camp. That investigation turned up a witness with information that would be essential to Vera's mission in Germany. His name was Franz Berg, a prisoner in Natzweiler who had been employed as a stoker in the camp crematorium. Berg's statement got things moving. He described the arrival of four women at Natzweiler in the July of 1944. He told our people how they had been killed. By injection, not gas. The doctors told them that the jab was for typhus. And uh, then he indicated that they had been burned alive. That the injection hadn't worked. Berg said, and this was backed up later by other witnesses, that one of the women had woken up as she was about to be put in the oven. She scratched the face of the camp doctor. Could these four women be part of the seven that Adette Sansom had travelled with 
to Karlsruhe. With Berg's testimony in hand, Vera was able to convince her superiors that somebody needed to confirm the identities of the women who had died at Natzweiler. If what he said was true, then the brutal manner of their deaths would be impossible to keep quiet in the long term. The press would have a field day with the idea that the British government had sent women to burn alive in France. If Vera was allowed to investigate, find out the whole story, then the government could control the narrative. After all, who knew if Franz Berg's testimony could even be relied upon? If he could cozy up to the SS, then he was more than capable of spinning a sensational yarn for the British. Vera wouldn't rest until she knew for sure. So MI6 agreed to foot my bill, good of them, and I set to work breaking down my office. With Vera's departure, the SOE ceased to exist. I sent out letters with a forwarding address to the families. For the girls that Odette claimed she'd been with at Karlsruhe. I allowed for a little sentiment. Most of them had left things with me. A coat, a photograph. Things they couldn't take with them to France. I sent those back to the families. And I told them I was looking for them. To see if they'd been at Natzweiler if they had died there. Vera left the SOE headquarters for the last time on the 8th of January, 1946. MI6 had given her three months to find out what had become of the seven missing women. I arrived in Bad Ernhausen the next day. I was billeted in a rather spartan little room. One chair, one desk, one ashtray. It was perishing cold, too. I hadn't dressed for the weather. But, you know, all that aside, it was where I needed to be. Vera was now in a position to find out whether some of the girls that Odette Sansom had met on the way to Karlsruhe Prison had died at Natzweiler. She had been corresponding with another ex-SOE agent, a man called Brian Stonehouse. Remarkably, Stonehouse had survived four concentration camps. One of them had been Natzweiler. If anyone could shed light on what happened there, it was him. Shortly after her arrival in Germany, he wrote to Vera to relay a long buried memory from his time at the camp. He remembered, or thought he remembered, three English girls. He described three women he was sure that one of them was Diana Rowden. This was the first name Vera could tick off her list. She had been among the seven girls in Karlsruhe prison. The second girl he knew was Vera Lee. The third girl he described was shorter, darker skinned. He couldn't swear to who she was. I assumed that this was the same girl that Odette had been unable to identify. He said there might have been a fourth as well. That would have been André Burrell. Franz Berg had identified her from a photograph. I knew that much. Through cross-referencing Stonehouse's descriptions, with those from Franz Berg's statement, Vera was now able to place three of the SOE women from the Karlsruhe prison transport at Natzweiler. Diana, Vera, André. Name by name, she was getting closer to the truth. The fourth girl? That would have to wait. Vera had an idea of who it might have been, even who it probably was. But she wasn't sure. Not 100%. And she needed 100%. There were still three other women, identified by Odette, whose fate, post Karlsruhe, was unknown. So I decided to go to Karlsruhe prison myself. I spoke to the wardress and she confirmed that all seven of the women Odette had travelled with had been imprisoned there, per my descriptions. Strangely, she claimed to have no memory whatsoever of their departure. The prison records had been destroyed too, supposedly by the French, which was also strange. <laughs> Why would they do it? What would they gain? Like so many Germans who had served the Nazi regime in more peripheral ways, the war dress of Karlsruhe prison was naturally inclined to suppress any potentially incriminating acts on her part. Destroying documents would count. No, you're right. I did not trust the wardress. Vera returned to Karlsruhe several times over the next few days. 
interviewing various local people with connections to the prison. It was a fairly exhausting process, the truth be told. Interrogations for days on end. Nobody knew anything about where the girls had been taken after Karlsruhe. And then, finally, Hedvig Müller came forward. Hedvig Müller was a local woman who had been arrested by the Gestapo for mocking Hitler in public. She claimed that she had been imprisoned with several of the women Vera was seeking. She was a quiet girl, a nurse, around 29. She had known Odette, who left Karlsruhe for Ravensbrück before the others were moved. The rest had left in two groups, which went some way to explaining why Brian Stonehouse had remembered only three or four girls arriving at Natzweiler together. Perhaps he had missed a second arrival later on. Or, or perhaps the other girls, the last three, were sent somewhere else. Now, Vera needed to know which girls had left Karlsruhe together. Only then could she positively identify all of the girls who had arrived and later burnt at Natzweiler. Brian Stonehouse had confirmed the presence of Diana Rowden and Vera Lee. Franz Berg had given her Andre Burrell. But Hedvig could not identify the small, dark, mystery woman who had accompanied those three women to their deaths. So instead, I asked her, who stayed behind after the first four left? Hedvig offered up more descriptions. No trace of emotion flickered through Vera's face as she marked more names off her mental list. She was closing in. None of the three women Hedvig described who remained in Karlsruhe could have matched the description of the fourth Natzweiler girl. Through this process of elimination, Vera was able to make an educated guess at her identity. Based on the evidence available to me, I believe that it must have been Nora. Nor Iniat Khan. Nor Iniat Khan. Nora to her friends in England. Recognize the name. We told her story in episode 27 of True Spies. Codename Madeline. She was F-Section's first female wireless operator, a particularly dangerous role that came with a heightened risk of capture. After all, concealing your identity is one thing. Concealing a bulky radio transmitter is quite another. She was captured by the Gestapo in Paris in 1943. Nora was brave, but she wasn't confident. During her training, several officers expressed doubts about her. She hated lying, for a start, and she was a very gentle girl. But when the time came to send another wireless operator to France, I put her forward. I put her on the plane. She knew the risks. Throughout her time in Germany, it was Nora who played most on Vera's mind. Now, she was almost certain that she had been the fourth prisoner in Natzweiler the fourth dead woman. And soon enough, she would have her chance to confirm her suspicions. As the first months of 1946 wore on, the Allied inquiry into the Natzweiler camp had developed. A trial was set for May. Every member of staff that could be tracked down was to be brought up on war crimes charges. That included Franz Berg, the prisoner who had manned the crematorium where allegedly the SOE women had been burned alive. Berg was what was known as a capo, a prisoner who secured special privileges by working with the Nazis. Vera saw her opportunity to properly interrogate Berg, to pump him for any information that could lead to the definitive identification of all four of the SOE victims at Natzweiler. They led Berg in and sat him down. He hadn't been hard to find. Everybody at the Natzweiler camp knew Kapo Berg. He was a gossip. So I began to ask him about the women he had cremated. Every detail. Where were you when you first saw them? What time? Describe them. Berg did as he was asked. Vera took notes. All killed, undressed. Clothes and bags put into cell 11. First girl, dark blonde, about 32. Vera Lee. Second, slim, dark. I believed that to be Nora. Third was Diana Rowden. Then Andre Burrell. Berg's description of the second girl was enough to satisfy Vera. She now believed that she knew exactly who had died at Natzweiler. 
This was the kind of information that could swing the balance of a war crimes trial. Vera shared the information with Jurka Galitzin, the intelligence officer who had discovered the horrors of Natzweiler and was still playing an important role in the prosecution. I met Jurka Galitzin a couple of weeks later. He came to the villa at Gaganau where I was staying. He came to brief us about the trial. He asked me if I was sure that the identities of the F-section victims were finalized. I said there had been doubts, but I was satisfied now. But Vera's personal satisfaction was not enough. To prosecute the staff of Natzweiler for the deaths of the agents, there could be no room for doubt. The defense team would leap on it. <sighs> Which was frustrating because the only way to determine those identities would have been the prisoner records from Karlsruhe, which had been destroyed. Or so I was told. I mentioned this to the room. Bill Barkworth, who was leading his own investigation into Natzweiler, stood up and declared that of course the wardress was lying and that we should search her premises immediately, as well as the prison itself. He had the firepower and, frankly, the support that I lacked, and he got things done. A small convoy of military jeeps roared across town to the private home of the wardress. Bill Barkworth, the charismatic head of an SAS intelligence operation working parallel to Vera, searched the property. Meanwhile, Vera returned to Karlsruhe prison to search for any hidden records there. We lined up the prison staff and questioned them. We tore the place halfway apart looking for these records, but we turned up nothing. Then Barkworth's jeep pulled up outside the gates. There were boxes piled high in the back. I remember the look on his face. He was grinning. Barkworth's boxes contained records for every prisoner, going back years. Vera flicked through until she found the records for May, 1944, when her agents had arrived at Karlsruhe. I crossed them off one at a time. A dead, she'd returned safely, as I said. Then Vera Lee, Diana Rowden, Andre Burrell, the Natzweiler girls, Yolande Beekman, Madeleine Damamont, Elian Plumen. I knew they'd been at Karlsruhe. They left later on. I didn't know where to, not yet anyway. She kept looking. There was one name that eluded her. Nora wasn't there. Not Nora, not Nor, not any of her known aliases. But to my mind, she had to have been there. There was one other name. Someone who had been admitted to the prison on the same day as the other girls and taken away to Natzweiler with the first group. Sonia Olczaneski. i never heard of her. I decided that it must have been a new alias for Nora. She was born in Moscow after all. She might have chosen a Russian name. In any case, I had already notified the families. It had to be her. Like so many things in her life, Vera had closed the book on the identity issue. Wouldn't you? Put yourself in Vera's shoes. The description you've been given seems to match Nor. It's certainly close enough, especially given that she might have changed herself physically during her time in the field. Disguise was second nature to an SOE spy. Nor had been trained to dye her hair, to transform herself. Then there was the Russian connection, and nobody else seemed to know as Sonia Olczaneski. It had to be an alias, didn't it? And you want it to be her, for her family, for yourself. The pain of losing her would be less than the agony of never knowing what had happened. So when the Nassweiler trials took place in May 1946, Vera was the first to take the stand. I named the dead on the condition that they were left out of the newspapers to protect the next of kin. That was the official line. In reality, it was in the British establishment's interests, Vera included, to suppress the names of the agents who had died. They didn't want to answer awkward questions about the women's true role, or that of the SOE in general. Vera's mission was halfway done. Well, four-sevenths of the way, to be precise. With the Natzweiler trial concluded, she turned her attention to the other three women who had been imprisoned at Karlsruhe. Yoland Beekman. Madeleine de Mamont, Eliane Plumen. Quite by chance, her new mission got off to a strong start. 
I went back to Bad Ernhausen. And there I found a statement from some American investigators who had been sniffing around Karlsruhe too, because we all shared intelligence when it was appropriate. The Americans had interrogated a Gestapo officer who claimed that in September 1944, a transport had left Karlsruhe for Dachau, a camp famous for its barbarism, even by Nazi standards. Was this where the remaining girls had met their end? The dates lined up. The record shows that they had been moved from Karlsruhe around that time. But there was one thing in the Gestapo man's testimony that stuck out. All the way through, he spoke about four prisoners being taken to Dachau. There were seven SOE women at Karlsruhe. Four had died at Natzweiler. There should only have been three of our girls left. So who was the fourth woman taken to Dachau from Karlsruhe? If our people were held under Nacht und Nebel, they would not have been mixed in with the general prison population. She had to be involved with intelligence work. But she wasn't one of ours, I thought. And I had my priorities. As Vera read on, she noted that the fourth prisoner had been held at another prison close by, Forzheim, and had been brought to Karlsruhe to join the others before they were transported to Dachau. At the time, although she couldn't account for the fourth prisoner, this detail seemed irrelevant. She kept reading. They were executed the morning after they arrived. Shot through the head, all four of them, all in a row. That's what the Gestapo said. We don't know for sure how it was done. It seems unlikely that they would be so charitable. With this tragic revelation, Vera's business in Germany was at an end. The dates matched, the descriptions matched. She was satisfied that Madeleine de Mamont, Yolande Beekman, and Eliane Plumen had died at Dachau. She returned to London, where she began to prepare for a return to normal life. My three months on the MI6 payroll were up, and I was tired of the military, and I'd worked damn hard for my rank. Now it felt like a weight. But life so rarely accommodates the courses we chart for ourselves. At home in London, Vera received another letter. It did not make for easy reading. Uh, the letter came from a Yolande Lagrave. The name meant nothing to me. The letter had been sent to a member of the House of Lords who had known Yolande Lagrave before the war. It had been bounced between various government departments until it had eventually reached Vera. As it turned out, the Lagrave woman had been French resistance. Her husband had died at Dachau. She had been deported to Fortsheim prison, also in Germany. Lagrave went on. She wrote about an English parachutist she had met in Fortsheim. A woman whose hands and feet were always bound, an escape risk. And her name was Nora Baker. This couldn't be right. Nora Baker, a.k.a. Nora Inyat Khan, had died at Natsvala. Vera was sure of it, wasn't she? The letter was authentic. It listed Nora's address in London, and there was no possible way she could have known that, unless she had spoken to her. In truth, the evidence that had placed Nora at Natsvala had always been shaky, based more on Vera's self-assurance than solid fact. Now, with one letter, her entire conception of events, the narrative she had forced herself to believe, had been disrupted. Now, she had to correct her mistake, preferably before anyone found out. Madame Lagrave had managed to contact Nora's family, too. They knew that the official line, what I had told them, was untrue. I had to fix it. Around the same time, Vera became aware of another investigation into Nora's whereabouts. It was being conducted by a sharp young war crimes lawyer named Nicholson. He had managed to track Nora to Fortsheim and spoken to several people who knew her there. Nicholson's report gave Vera all the information she needed to reopen her investigation into Nora's fate. But what could she do from London? Fortunately, timing was on her side. A new trial, this time for the war criminals of Ravensbrück camp, was underway in Germany. The authorities there had asked for Vera's assistance. So I went over there again, did my bit at the Ravensbrück trial, took a few days' leave, told them I had a few loose ends to tie up at Bad Ernhausen. In fact, 
Vera was heading to the town of Minden, just north of Bad Oenhausen. There was a British prison there. In that prison was an inmate who might be able to confirm a niggling suspicion fermenting at the back of her brain. Three girls had been taken from Karlsruhe prison and killed at Dachau. They were joined by a fourth prisoner before they were taken to their deaths. A prisoner from Fortsheim. Think about it. Why would the Germans have felt it necessary to execute women from different prisons together? What did they have in common? They were spies. Our spies. Had Noor Iniat Khan died at Dachau. As she approached the prison at Minden, she hoped against hope that she was about to find out. Max Vassner was the Gestapo officer responsible for transporting the girls from Karlsruhe to Dachau. He was late 50s, looked older. I'd spoken to him before during the first Dachau investigation. He hadn't had a lot to say. He denied that he'd witnessed the murders, although a colleague of his had put him at the scene. Vassner was still reluctant to talk about the details of the executions. But that wasn't what Vera was here for. She only needed one answer. So I asked him, did you take four girls to Dachau? And he said yes. Vassner also provided brief descriptions of the girls. One small, a round face, Madeleine Damemont. One tall, blonde, a little German. That was Yolande Beekman. One ordinary, average, Alain Plumen. And then, Nora. Nor. Vasna was led back to his cell. Vera had her answers. Nor Iniak Khan had died at Dachau. Yes. The story we got from the Gestapo men was that they had all been shot. That seemed too clean, I think I said. Later, it came out that one of the men spoke to Nicholson, the lawyer, during his investigation, and said that he'd spoken to Max Vassner about the killings. And Vassner had said, Do you want to know how it really happened? He did not. This is the end of Vera's story, at least the part we're telling. She left government service shortly after returning to London and retired early in 1961. She wasn't perfect, and she made mistakes. But nobody could argue that she hadn't tried her best for the women she had lost. That said, there's one more mystery we haven't addressed. Four women died at Natzweiler. Vera had believed that Noor Inyat Khan was one of them, but now we know she died later, miles away at Dachau. So who was the fourth woman to burn at Natzweiler? We have a name. Sonia Olczynski. Originally, Vera had assumed that this was one of Noor's aliases. But once she knew otherwise, she dropped that particular thread. It was only picked up years later. So, who was Sonia Olczynski? First of all, Sonia Olczynski was a real person. In fact, as a courier for the SOE, she had served with Noor Iniat Khan in Paris. It had been Sonia who had first alerted the SOE to Noor's capture in the autumn of 1943. For reasons unknown, her message was ignored. The Nazis continued to use Noor's radio to send fake messages back and forth to London, resulting in the capture of several more agents, including Sonia herself, a few months later. The SOE let her down at every turn. When wars end, some people get justice. Some people just don't. I'm Vanessa Kirby. Vera Atkins was voiced by Claire Willey. We'd like to thank Sarah Helm, author of A Life in Secrets, Vera Atkins and the Lost Agents of SOE, from which we drew the research for this episode. Join us next week for another operation behind enemy lines with True Spies. We all have valuable spy skills and our experts are here to help you discover yours. Get an authentic assessment of your spy skills created by a former head of training at British Intelligence at spicegate.com. <laughs>